Uh, so uh, let's go ahead uh, and get started. Um, but good evening, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you to the Rowena Nuclear Age Talk. Uh, this series was endowed by Jack Rowena, who is a professor emeritus of electrical engineering at MIT, who passed away in 2015. Professor Rowena was instrumental in establishing the MIT Security Studies Program back in 1976, and also served as uh, its first director. His special interest throughout his career was in strategic uh, weapons uh, policy. Professor uh, Ruina exemplified MIT's motto of mens et manus, loosely translated from Latin as mind and hand. This refers to the educational ideals of MIT's founders uh, who were promoting above all education for a practical application, uh, putting knowledge into action and moving from ideas uh, to impact. After teaching at Brown University and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, Jack joined the MIT faculty in 1963 as a member of the Department of, uh, Department of EE until his uh, retirement in 1997. In addition to his own teaching and research, Jack uh, played an active role in the US government's development of scientific research related uh, to national security. In the early 1960s, he served for three years as director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, now called DARPA, overseeing the development of technologies for uh, the seismic detection of nuclear tests missile defense systems and radar, and even hiring JCR Licklider in creating the product that would become ARPANET, one of the early progenitors of the global internet. Later, uh, Jack served as president of the Institute uh, for Defense Analyses, as a member of the General Advisory Committee on the Atomic Energy Commission, and as a senior consultant uh, to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. This year, uh, I'm especially delighted to welcome uh, William Perry to be our speaker. Uh, he also ex exemplifies uh, Men's at Manus, or the MIT motto. So Secretary Perry was the 19th Secretary of Defense for the United States, serving from uh, February of 1994 to January of 1997. He previously served as the Deputy Secretary of Defense, excuse me, he was the 19th Secretary of Defense for the United States, I misspoke, serving from February 1994 to January 1997. He previously served as Deputy Secretary of Defense from 1993 to 1994, and as Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering from 1977 to 1981. He's been a professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford University uh, since 1986, where he's now an emeritus professor. His previous business experience includes serving as the Laboratory Director for General Telephone and Electronics and as a founder and as founder and president of ESL Inc. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. From 1946 to 1947, uh, Secretary Perry was an enlisted man in the Army Corps of Engineers and served in the Army occupation uh, of occupation in Japan. He was a second lieutenant in the Army Reserves from 1950 to 1995. He's been awarded uh, or received numerous awards from governments around the world, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Knight Commander of the British Empire, and Japan's Order of, of the Rising Sun, among uh, many others. Finally, he's, uh, amid all this, published three books, Preventive Defense with Ash Carter, my journey at the nuclear brink and the button uh, with Tom Colina. So Secretary Perry, thank you uh, so much uh, for joining uh, us today. And I now turn uh, uh, the virtual floor uh, over to you. Thank you, Taylor. <clears throat> Let me start by saying what an honor it is to be giving a talk named for Jack Lurina. I was a good friend and a great American, I believe. I have lived long enough to worry through all the major historical nuclear events. And I know that my life would have been a lot easier if I had learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. But I've never been able to do that. And every new experience I've had in my career has made me even more concerned that the bomb would bring about the end of civilization. And so I have become a crusader to abolish the nuclear bomb. At my age, a nuclear catastrophe, while well, it would be the end of my life, is, is not that big a deal. I've lived 93 years, I've had a full life, I'm ready to go. But it would mean that my 13 grandchildren would never have a chance to live their life. And that thought makes my crusade deeply personal. But even before I had grandchildren, I'd become deeply concerned <clears throat> about the existential danger the bomb poses to our civilization, and have worked to lower that danger, including advocating the abolition of nuclear weapons. I must say that many people have asked me how a former Secretary of Defense 
could support the abolition of any weapon, including nuclear weapons. And this talk is a partial answer to that question. It is a personal history of how my thinking on nuclear weapons has evolved from Hiroshima to the present time. A few months ago, when we reached the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, I was inspired to think back to that fateful day and to my own reaction when I heard the news. I must be honest and tell you that I was overjoyed, overjoyed that the terrible war was finally end. And I was intensely curious about how this new bomb worked. But I was not thinking about what the long-term consequences of such a bomb might be. That would come later. A few months after Hiroshima, I turned 18 and joined the Army's Corps of Engineers and in time became a part of the Army of Occupation of Japan. I saw firsthand the once great city of Tokyo reduced to rubbles by our firebombs. Then I was sent to Okinawa, the scene of the last great battle of World War II. A battle so fierce that only 10% of the 100,000 Japanese soldiers defending the islands survived. The rest were either killed in battle or committed suicide. There was hardly a building left standing in Naha, the capital city of Okinawa. The Japanese and the Okinawans that I worked with were still numb with the horror and the shock of what they had lived through. When I saw in Tokyo and Okinawa, totally removed any view that I might have had about the glory of war and convinced me that humanity could not continue its practice of engulfing the world in war nearly every generation. And I reflected that the devastation that I'd witnessed in Tokyo had been done with thousands of airplanes and tens of thousands of bombs over a period of years. Equivalent devastation could have been inflicted on Tokyo with one plane, one nuclear bomb, and in one instant. Similarly, the deaths and destruction in the Battle of Okinawa had taken place over several months and required an American landing force equivalent to the massive force we employed at D-Day and tens of thousands of American casualties. The Japanese forces in Okinawa could have been defeated in an instant with one nuclear bomb. Einstein said that with the advent of the nuclear bomb, everything has changed, save our way of thinking. But what I witnessed in Tokyo and Okinawa did begin to change my way of thinking. It led me to believe that we would have to completely reconsider the role of war, which had been with us since the beginning of history. As deadly as World War II was, even without nuclear bombs, a war with Hiroshima type bombs were widely used would be a far greater catastrophe than the one whose results I had witnessed. I concluded that the only reasonable goal of nuclear weapons would be to deter the use of nuclear weapons. Then in 1952, the United States tested a thermonuclear bomb that detonated with a destructive force a thousand times greater than the Hiroshima bomb. And a few years later, the Soviet Union tested one even more powerful. Subsequently, both the United States and the Soviet Union began deploying hydrogen bombs in their nuclear arsenals, most of them with a destructive fire of about 100 times the Hiroshima bomb. Each of our countries soon had the capability not only to destroy the other country, but to actually create an extinction event, an extinction event, an event comparable to when the large asteroid struck the earth 66 million years ago, which led to the extinction of most animal species then living, including all dinosaurs. That extinction was caused, of course, by a natural phenomenon. Now mankind has in his own hands the power to get, cause its own extinction. That led me to conclude that the deterrence policy to the United States and the Soviet Union had to be completely foolproof. But even as I concluded this, I feared that it might not be possible to achieve that result. In October of 1962, my fears were confirmed. 
At the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was managing an electronics laboratory in California, but I was called back to Washington to lead a small technical team. Our job was to provide President Kennedy with a daily assessment of the operational readiness of the nuclear missiles that the Soviet Union had deployed to Cuba. Kennedy's military advisors were urging him to authorize military action against those missiles. Instead, he wanted to try to resolve the crisis through diploma, diplomacy, since he feared that any military action could easily escalate into a nuclear war. Still, he was prepared to take military action before the Soviet missile became operational, and he was using our input to determine how many more days he had for diplomacy. With the intimate picture I was getting as the crisis unfolded, I believe that every day that I went into the analysis center was going to be my last day on earth. Against all odds, Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to reach an agreement before the missiles became operational, but it was a very close call. Kennedy later estimated the chances of the Cuban Missile Crisis ending in a nuclear catastrophe were about one in three. One chance in three for the destruction of our civilization. But I believe that Kennedy was an optimist. When he said that, he did not know that the Soviets had deployed in Cuba not only the medium range missiles that were the cause of the crisis, but also short range nuclear missiles that were already operational. If he had accepted the military's advice and had troops invaded Cuba, they would have been decimated on the beachhead with nuclear weapons and a general nuclear war would surely have followed. We avoided that tragedy as much by good luck as by good management. But our governments learned the wrong lesson from the Cuban Missile Crisis. The US concluded that it had won because we had more nuclear weapons than the Soviet Union. So we worked to sustain and increase that lead. The Soviet Union concluded that they had lost because they did not have enough nuclear weapons. So they began the major nuclear buildup. Both the United States and the Soviet Union apparently thought that the more nuclear weapons would put them in a better position to win the next crisis without really reflecting on what win meant. Before the resulting nuclear arms race had run out of steam, our planet had 70,000 nuclear weapons, 70,000. And fissile material to build many tens of thousands more. We had enough to obliterate each other and the rest of the planet many times over. Both the US and the Soviet Union were so focused on building nuclear bombs that neither considered the reality that although neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev wanted a nuclear war, we almost blundered into one. Neither side focused on the unprecedented level of tragedy that such a war would have caused. But I saw that crisis up close and I learned a different lesson. I learned that even though our two leaders were doing everything they could to avoid a nuclear war, we came very close to having one. Even the best deterrence policy could not prevent us from blundering, from blundering into a nuclear war. In 1977, I became the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And during my term in office, I learned another lesson about nuclear deterrence. I was awoken at three o'clock in the morning by a phone call from the watch officer at our missile warning center. He told me that his computers were showing 200 missiles, 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I will never, ever forget that call. Happily, he quickly added that he had determined that the, his computers were in error. Why was he calling me? I was not in the chain of command at the time. He was calling me because he wanted me to figure out what the hell had happened to his computers. And the sequel of that story, it took about three days to figure out. And it was a small, minor, insignificant microchip in the computer that had gone faulty. But, if, but I think the important point was that before he recognized he had a false alarm, he already had called the White House to alert them. We came within a few minutes, literally a few minutes, of the president being awoken 
to decide whether to launch our missile in response to this presumed attack. And if the president had decided to launch, he would have started a nuclear war by accident, by blunder. What I learned from my experience, <clears throat> experiences from the Cuban Missile Crisis and that false alarm was that our deterrence policy was not sufficient to prevent a civilization ending nuclear war. The danger of a nuclear war was not that one leader would suddenly launch a surprise disarming attack, which is what we were preparing for, but that we would blunder into a nuclear war. The blunder could result from a political miscalculation as in the Cuban Missile Crisis or in an accident as in the false alarm I experienced. Either of them, either of them could have resulted in the end of our civilization. Those experiences taught me that our nuclear policy should be directed to avoiding such a blunder. Yet in the years since then, we have evolved a deterrence policy that actually increases the probability of blundering into a nuclear war. We have continued to focus our nuclear posture and policies on preparing for surprise disarming attack. And those policies dealing with that con unlikely contingency actually increase the likelihood of an accident, accidental nuclear war. The response of both American and Soviet leaders to the Cuban Missile Crisis was to double down on their dangerous policies by greatly increasing the size of our nuclear arsenal while maintaining the same policies that almost caused the Cuban Missile Crisis to become an extinction event. In 1944, pardon me, in 1994, I became the Secretary of Defense and as such had an opportunity to do something about my concerns about plundering into a nuclear war. And I made lowering nuclear dangers my highest priority. This was facilitated by what was called the Dunn Lugar program that had been passed before I took office. It would be hard to overstate just how many obstacles there were to implementing that vital program. But Senator Sam Nunn was at that time the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he gave me his full support in implementing the legislation that he and Senator Luger had pioneered. As a result, we were able to dismantle 8,000 nuclear weapons during the three years that I was secretary, half in the United States and half in Russia. But reducing nuclear weapons was only part of my goal. The more important part was establishing a friendly, cooperative relation with Russia. And I worked very hard at that. I met with all key Russian government officials four or five times and with the Russian Minister of Defense more than a dozen times. We met in Washington, Moscow, Brussels, Geneva, Whiteman Air Force Base, Fort Riley, Saratov Air Base, Kiev, and Pervomysk. We organized a joint US-Russia rescue training mission. We negotiated an agreement whereby Russia would blend down HEU taken from former Soviet warheads so they could be used as fuel for American power reactors. We negotiated an agreement whereby Russia would deploy a brigade into an American division for the peace and force operation in Bosnia. We had a hotline on our desk that allowed me to discuss urgent issues as they come up. I had him as my guest at the NATO defense ministers meeting. And I introduced him to President Clinton and his cabinet office. In sum, I was in very close communication with the Russian Minister of Defense, and I used that closeness to facilitate specific joint programs, such as the dismantlement of nuclear weapons in Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine, and the joint deployment of American and Russian troops in Bosnia. But I also used that closeness as a mechanism for bringing our two countries closer together as partners, if not as allies. And so when I left office in 1977, I believe that we're well on our way to dismantling the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War and that the hostility that existed during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union with all of its dangers was now behind us. But that was not to be. A series of policy decisions followed the next few decades that led to increasingly bitter reactions from Russia. Those included the expansion of NATO, withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, 
and the war in Iraq. As a result, a second term of the Bush administration, the relations have become increasingly unfriendly and nuclear dangers were again a serious concern. That led four American statesmen to take a dramatic action. George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, Sam Nunn and I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which recited the new nuclear dangers and argued that the world should not have to live with this danger and that we should abolish nuclear weapons. And for a few years, the response to our op-eds was very positive in the United States and worldwide. And I was beginning to let myself hope that we might just succeed. Just a month after President Obama took office, he made a remarkable speech in Prague where he said, I state clearly and with conviction the commitment of the United States to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Later that year, Obama negotiated the New START Treaty with Russia. It entailed rather modest reductions in the nuclear forces of both countries, but it was to be followed by New START II, which would entail much more significant reductions. We were on our way, or so I thought. But Obama ran into a buzzsaw when he tried to get his treaty ratified in the US Senate. He finally negotiated an agreement with the opposition where they gave their approval after he agreed to an extensive new nuclear modernization program. In my judgment, that price was too high. And apparently in Obama's judgment as well, for at this point, he stopped pursuing what we call his Prague agenda. And the four statesmen who had been pursuing nuclear abolition stopped their joint efforts. I was profoundly disappointed at the failure of Obama's initiative, but I decided that the problem was too grave for me to simply give up. If we could not abolish nuclear weapons at this time, at least we could take actions to lower their dangers. And to encourage those actions, I formed so-called William J. Perry Project. Its goals were to educate the public on nuclear dangers and to advocate specific actions to reduce those dangers. I worked to promote those ideas through papers, op-eds, classes, talks, and books. In 2015, I wrote My Journey at the Nuclear Brink. Then in 10, 2020, Tom Kalina and I jointly wrote The Button. The Button recommends smaller actions we can take, like removing presidential sole authority to launch, phasing out our ICBMs, and until that happens, prohibiting launch on warning. I see those actions as smaller steps that can keep us alive until we get to a mindset that allows us to agree to the abolition of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> I'm now producing a series of podcasts that tell the same story, but in the medium more likely to reach younger people. To bolster my goal of having the podcast reach younger people, I asked my granddaughter, Lisa Perry, to organize and narrate the pod. And she did a remarkable job, I believe. Through all of these actions, I work with the institutions who have labored for years to promote the same message, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Plowshares, and the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. Our goal is the same, to mitigate and in time to eliminate the danger of a nuclear catastrophe. At times, I get quite frustrated being a prophet of doom. And I get discouraged because my warnings of, of existential dangers and the modest recommendations on how to lower those dangers are not being seriously debated. But I will not give up. The stakes are too high. In the beginning of my talk, I said that a large scale nuclear war could lead to an extinction event comparable to the one that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. I said that to get your attention, but I say it is not, it is not hyperbola. While many dinosaurs were killed by the direct effects of the energy released by the asteroid, the decisive effect was the nuclear winter caused by the massive burning of the planet's forests. This nuclear winter lasted for many years and caused the, caused the destruction of nearly all vegetation, thereby killing vegetation, vegetable eating animals which in turn deprived carnivorous animals of food. In September, 
We who live in California experience a small scale preview of nuclear winter caused by the smoke from the extensive forest fires in Northern California. In my home in Palo Alto, we actually experienced a darkness at noon. The smoke sitting on top of the clouds prevented the sunlight from getting through, making noon seem like midnight. We only experienced this serious blockage for a few days, but it was easy to imagine the widespread crop failure the result from it lasting a few years or even a few months. In a large scale nuclear war, there would be hundreds of millions of people killed by the direct effects of the bombs. But there would also be extensive fire sets as hundreds of cities and surrounding forests burned. Our limited experience of a darkness at noon in San Francisco would be a limited version of what we would experience over a wide area of the planet for several years. And so I believe the least, the least result of a large scale nuclear war would be the destruction of our civilization, but it could very well result in the extinction of our species. In sum, my lifetime has been all of the major nuclear crises, including a few that nearly brought our civilization to an end, and I experienced them up close. They influenced my thinking in important ways, which I've summarized in this talk. And as much as I've wanted to stop worrying and love the bomb, these experiences have not allowed me to do that. Instead, I have divided, decided to devote my life to trying to lower the dangers of nuclear warfare until such time until our population can grasp the danger and be ready to consider the abolition of nuclear weapons. It has been a lonely fight and one that has been largely unsuccessful, but I will not give up. In the hope that my 13 grandchildren be, will be able to live a full and rewarding life is the motivation that keeps me going. With this grim prospect facing humanity, it would seem that it's time to get serious about dealing with the very real dangers both posed by the thousands of nuclear weapons in the world it is time to start moving towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. And until that can be achieved, taking the smaller but critically important steps, steps that are spelled out in my book, The Button, no step that would lower the risk that we blunder into a nuclear war. Taylor, that's my talk. Thank you for listening to me. And I'll be oh. happy to take any questions or comments. Bill, thank you so much. Um, what an inspiring talk on a grim subject, but. Uh, I think the inspiration uh, certainly um, is what I'm going to uh, take away from uh, this evening. Uh, so the floor is open. Um, please uh, raise your uh, blue hand in the Zoom uh, chat feature if you'd like to ask a question. And I ask, uh, when I do call on you, uh, please just briefly introduce yourself and explain sort of your affiliation uh, to the Security Studies Program so Secretary Perry has an idea of who he's interacting with. So. Uh, first off, um, I'd like to call on uh, Heather Williams. Heather, uh, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Taylor. And thank you so much, Secretary Perry. This is a really uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, my name is Heather Williams. I'm a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow. Uh, I'm visiting MIT just for this year. I'm normally a lecturer at King's College London. And my, my work largely focuses on arms control. Uh, so, you know, New START, the NPT, and different arms control mechanisms. Um, my question is um, actually about the nuclear ban treaty, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the TPNW. And I was just wondering if you could share your views on that treaty and whether or not you see it contributing to nuclear disarmament, given that the nuclear possessors aren't participating. Um, and if you see it as a, as a good contribution towards the efforts to uh, reach global zero. So thank you again so much. Oh, thank you, Heather. And you are the, exactly the person I'm addressing this talk to. I want the young people to understand that my generation has failed to solve, result, deal with the problem that we have created. It's going to be up to you to leave this problem that we're dumping in your lap. Um, the, I support the treaty. I support it because I, not because I think it's going to have any immediate effect 
certainly not because none of the nuclear powers agreed to sign it, participate in it. So it's not going to have, it's not going to change anything in the world in the, in the near term. In the long term, though, <clears throat> it's setting a standard that nuclear weapons are, you know, should be illegal and immoral. And setting, creating a way of thinking about them, which over time, I think, will gradually change people's minds. I told you how discouraged I get trying to get people concerned about these dangers. They will get concerned about it when they begin to understand how dangerous they are. When they begin to realize that these weapons are immoral and should be illegal. This treaty sets that standard. And so I think it takes us in a small but important step in the right direction. Great, thanks. Uh, next, uh, Pippin Narang. Pippin, over to you. Hi, Secretary Perry. Great to see you. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a phenomenal talk. Uh, and it's an honor to see you as always. Uh, I was exactly 20 years ago in your management science and engineering 193 class. Uh, <laughs> So it's been, uh, it, it's, it's great to, to see this come full circle. Uh, I have, I'm gonna abuse uh, the, the, uh, the chance and ask two questions. Uh, I've been teaching at MIT now for a decade and I, I, want, um, I wanna ask you about first North Korea. Um, in 1994, uh, as you've written, uh, you noted that the strike order against Yongbyon was on your desk uh, until you got a call that uh, former President Carter uh, had negotiated what then led to the agreed framework with North Korea. Knowing what we know now, would you have done anything differently in 1994 with respect to North Korea's nuclear weapons program? And the second question is, you know, while we work in parallel to reduce the chance of accidental or inadvertent nuclear use in the United States, I look around the world and I see uh, a much more dangerous world where the the prospects for advertent or intentional nuclear use are rising, particularly in Asia. Uh, you know, you have the India-Pakistan uh, enduring crises and conflict. India and China have had a recent, uh, you know, military clash. Uh, and you have North Korea on the eastern flank of that alleyway of nuclear powers. Uh, and with each crisis, it seems that the, the nations involved uh, seem to take the lesson that they walked away unscathed due to skill and not luck. Uh, and I worry about India and Pakistan stumbling into a nuclear use, into nuclear use as well. What are some of the steps we can take to mitigate uh, risks, particularly in that alleyway of nuclear weapons powers, uh, such that we don't get inadvertent or advertent nuclear use uh, in, in newer and uh, regional nuclear powers? I think you're exactly right to worry about the India-Pakistan. They have had, each side has several hundred nuclear weapons. Uh, each side, they have had three or perhaps four wars, depending on how you count them, over an issue still not resolved. So a possibility of another war is very real. And the possibility if they have another war, shooting war, that it would escalate into a nuclear war is very real. We tend to say, brush that off and say, well, that's too bad for the Indian and Pakistanis. Well, it is too bad for them to be, no doubt, tens of millions of people killed. But there would also be hundreds of cities set in flames. And the possibility that a nuclear winter of some degree would be started by that is very real. And so this is, my view of the Indian Pakistan nuclear war, if it were to happen, is it would affect the whole planet. It would affect not just Indian Pakistan. And that's why, <clears throat> just another reason for taking it more seriously than we are now taking it. On North Korea, we came, I think, uh, fairly close to military conflict during that crisis in 1994. So I can tell you, I was enormously relieved when I was sitting in the Situation Room with the president. And he got a message that President Carter was on the phone with the message from Pyongyang. And that message being that <clears throat> Kim Il-sung was ready to negotiate. And he was ready to stop his work on his nuclear reactor until such time as we had an agreement. We got an agreement called the Agreed Framework. 
negotiated by Bob Kalish, which I think is a good agreement, but for various reasons, no, one of which at least was the fact that the United States had always carried out its end of the agreement very robustly. But in any event, for whatever reason, North Korea cheated on it by, by starting a covert program, not at the nuclear facility. And so we were in another crisis. And this time I was out of office but the president asked me to go and negotiate with North Korea on that crisis, which took me over to Pyongyang, where I had a, almost a week of negotiation with them on nuclear weapons and got an agreement that they would <clears throat> finally stop the nuclear program and not build a nuclear arsenal. A few months later, uh, Kim Jong-il sent his senior military man to Washington to meet with President Clinton and Secretary Albright and myself. And they came to a final handshake agreement with the president on that. So we were within months of having an agreement which I think would have stopped North Korea from building the nuclear arsenal. But a funny thing happened during that few months, which was called an election. And that election, instead of <clears throat> Al Gore winning the presidency, George W. Bush did. The difference, in, the importance on this issue is that Gore was prepared to go ahead and sign the agreement. And <clears throat> while Bush's Secretary of State said he was prepared to recommend that the president do that. And somebody else was recommending that George W. Bush, was, which was the vice president, Cheney, who recommended he withdraw from that agreement and move forward with a plan of putting maximum pressure on North Korea, causing them to collapse. That was another way of, of avoiding a nuclear bomb in North Korea. I had nothing against that way if they had any way of making it work, but in fact, they did not and it did not. And so we very quickly ended up with a new nuclear arsenal in North Korea. That's a short, very short history of a long and complicated problem. So North Korea now has a nuclear arsenal and President Trump made a great grandstand play trying that got nowhere at all. Good theater, but no results. I think President Biden, however he proceeds on it, will not have any better results. My own judgment, having met with and talked with the North Koreans at some length about this issue, is that they went to great costs and great, expense and great difficulties to, to build that nuclear arsenal. They built it because they wanted deterrence. Deterrence of the United States using military force to overthrow the regime. They now have it, they have that deterrence, it works. We, have, we should understand about deterrence. We've depended on it for a long time, but it does work. And so I don't think they have any intention of giving it up. And I don't think neither Trump, Trump, Trump didn't see, I think neither will Biden. We're gonna to have to learn to live with a North Korean nuclear weapon. We can talk all we want about whether we should recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. They are a nuclear weapon state, that's just a reality. And we have to learn to live with that. The good news from all this is I think they have no intention, no motivation, no reason for using that nuclear weapon in a provocative first strike fashion. It's there as a deterrence and that's the only way they will use it. They are not, in spite of what many people think, the North Koreans are not stupid, they're not reckless, and they have a purpose in mind and the purpose is to gain the deterrence and that's what they're gonna use it for. On um, thanks. Um, one other one other comment I'd like to make. I I'm happy to hear from one of my ex students. Um, sometimes I get discouraged by not being able to get the word across. I realize it's a slow acting process that the years I was teaching would show up five, 10, 15 years later. Seeing one of my students in this position at MIT makes me feel very good about it. I might mention another student of mine was Ted Lieu, who ends up being in Congress and he ends up sponsoring legislation that I've been advocating for a long time. So even though I get discouraged through the years of the lack of progress, I do see 
the slow acting, but long term, I think, positive effects of trying to educate people on these dangers. Thank you. Um, so I, now I wanted to call on one of our PhD students here at MIT, uh, Aiden Milliff. Aiden, over to you. Thanks, Taylor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about one of the themes which you brought up, which is learning the wrong lessons from good luck. I, I took that to be one of the main points of your talk, that security policymakers in the US are repeatedly learning the wrong lessons from the fact that they're still alive at the end of the crisis. Uh, and you talked about that both in terms of nuclear weapons and then also in terms of uh, other existential dangers like uh, climate change. And so I think this is a more general problem than just nuclear weapons. And I'm curious, as someone who's led a really large bureaucracy, how do you disincentivize overlearning from good luck? I'm sorry, I said again, please, Aiden. How do you disincentivize people from uh, learning the wrong lessons from good luck? I don't know how to do that, I have to say. I've tried unsuccessfully many times. But I mean, the, the classic example, which I gave in my talk was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the basic problem was that we focused on, that we, we had won, we had won in this crisis. And the Soviet Union focused on they had lost. And both sides said that the, what they really wanna do is win. And so, the, so we took actions which enhanced our chances of continuing to win. They took actions of trying to change the situation from a loser to winner. But the real point was that nobody won that crisis. The thing that happened was through, mostly through good luck, is sanity prevailed and we avoided a war altogether. There was not a winning or losing involved, there was avoiding a war, which was the real significant outcome of that crisis. But we, um, we seem to, we and the Russians also seem to have fixed in our mind the winning and losing is what it's all about. It's not as, <clears throat> it is not a zero sum game. Both sides, in a war, of course, both sides would lose and would lose very, very significantly. <clears throat> During the Cold War, we had brilliant strategists who were calculating the outcome of a nuclear exchange between Soviet Union and the United States. <clears throat> and they were conducted simulations and war games. One of them I remember in particular showed that we had won in this particular crisis because we had, <clears throat> the Russians had lost 100 million people and we'd only lost 70 million, some numbers like that. But how long anyone could think of that as winning when what was at stake really was that our whole civilization was, was gonna be crumbling around our feet. It's the winning and losing mentality, that's the zero sum game mentality, which is very hard to deal with because we think of that in many other in many walks of life. And we try to apply that same thinking to this issue and it just doesn't apply. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Trevor Prouty. Trevor, uh, over to you. Thanks, Taylor. And thank you, uh, Mr. Perry, for your uh, time this evening. Uh, I'm a Navy fellow at MIT right now here for a year. Uh, I'm a Naval aviator by trade, but I did have the opportunity to spend a couple of years at the National Military Command Center working in uh, NC3 operations which was definitely eye-opening for me with, you know, with my lack of background in it. And it's really the basis for my question this evening. Uh, do you see a place for technology and automation, including artificial intelligence, in reducing the threat of accidental nuclear launches? Or do you actually think the further removal of human components increases uh, potential nuclear conflict? I didn't, didn't get to quite try it again, please. Yeah, sure. Basically, the question is, do you see what through automation, technology, artificial intelligence, as we look to upgrade our, you know, our NC3 systems, do you think those will actually decrease uh, the threat of accidental, accidental nuclear launches? Or do you think removing the human component increases potential errors? And the short answer to the question, no, I do not think they will. Um, the fundamental problem, I believe, <clears throat> is that we have focused our policies on the wrong threat. We think the threat is a surprise disarming attack from Russia, just as we thought during the Cold War, it was a surprise disarming attack from the Soviet Union. 
And if that were the threat, we're doing the right things to deal with that. One of the things we do, for example, to deal with that is we have configured our forces and our policies for, for a very quick launch. We can launch our ICBMs in a matter of minutes from a warning that an attack is underway. And that's a remarkable technical accomplishment. I'm very uh, impressed with that kind of accomplishment. The danger of that accomplishment is, is that we can respond in two or three or four or five minutes to an alert and indicates that launch is that underway, the attack is underway in the United States. But it doesn't take into account that that information may be incorrect. I gave you one example in my talk of when the United States had received a false alert, false one. But we have had three of them that I'm personally familiar with, three false alarms, two of which we almost acted on. Russia that we know of has had at least two. One of them I commend to your attention is uh, written in a book called The Man Who Saved the World and is also a movie, The Man Who Saved the World, about the Russian Lieutenant Colonel who was in charge of the Soviet warning center at the time that he, that that's a center got a false alarm. And he took the courageous action of not relaying that alert up to the higher command where it would have gotten to the president. And then again, it was the middle of the night and they would have woken the president. He'd have to decide whether or not to respond to it. He decided it was too dangerous to do that because he thought it was a false alarm. And five minutes after he made that decision, they had irrefutable information that it was a false alarm. And had he sent that on, God knows what would have happened. He was rewarded for saving the world, by the way, by being demoted for not having followed orders. But you should you should all see that movie if you hadn't seen it. It's a very it's a very chilling story. Uh, next, uh, Jim Walsh. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, I work on nuclear questions here in the Security Studies Program, and I have attended a lot of Rowena dinners, many, many Rowena dinners. And I want to say that this was one of the best, certainly one of the most eloquent presentations we've had. And I think it's one that Jack would have been very happy with as he thought about this as a annual event. Uh, I, because of your extensive experience in government and your experience over time and being able to look back, I wanted to ask this question or at least get your reaction to this comment. It strikes me that governments in the main are more reactive than proactive and they prefer to hold on to their advantages as long as possible, generically speaking, but probably true for nuclear weapons. And if that's the case, it may be that states, let's just say the United States or democracies anyway, have to be pushed in order to make those difficult decisions because they will not make them on their own. It's not in their bones or in their practice. And I think we can both, you and I can both remember a time when uh, the Senate was filled with people of different parties who all supported a, um, movement towards arms control, if not disarmament. We, there was even a disarmament, a Senate select committee on disarmament, you know, imagine that. But I guess my question is we don't live in that time anymore. Those Republican senators don't, are, are long gone and we've entered an age of hyper-partisan politics in which soon as a person gets in office to the opposite point of view. And so in the, it, I guess I want you to react to the prospects going forward, how we might begin to think about these problems, that if it's true that governments will have to be pushed, and if it's true that hyperpartisanship may pose a new obstacle that we haven't had before. Thank you. I think you have described quite accurately the problem we have today, which makes the issue of the, the, I'm talking about more difficult to deal with than there was than has been for many years. So it's getting more difficult rather than less difficult because of the hyperpartisanship. Uh, one simple example of the point 
is one of the, perhaps the single most enlightened action of the Congress on nuclear dangers was what I called the non lugar program in my talk. This is a program that, that significantly reduced nuclear dangers in the world. And it was, co it was founded, it was co-sponsored by Sam Nunn, a Democrat, and Dick Lugar, a Republican. Lugar was an example, was one of some of the best, those two senators, were the, I think, are the examples of the, the best and the brightest in the Congress. Now, to your point of hyperpartisanship, the last time Dick Lugar ran for a in the primaries, he was defeated in the primaries by a Republican opponent. He was, uh, and so the last best chance of leadership in the Republican Party in this field was gone and was replaced by somebody who was a very hyperpartisan person. Uh, I have very little hope that this Congress is going to make any useful decisions in this area. And I have very little hope really that President Biden, however well-intentioned he may be, is gonna make be able to make much headway. I think we're in for a long, hard pull. So I started several times in my talk, I said how I was somewhat discouraged about this issue. I'm even more discouraged this year than I was last year. Um, uh, ne next we have uh, Yedrin Yu. Yedrin, over to you. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, for speaking to us today. It's really an honor. So my name is Yejin Yun. I'm, a, I'm also a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow. So I have a question about the non-Lugar Cooperative Threat Reduction Program that you just mentioned. So what was the convergence of factors that made this program so successful despite the challenges that you alluded to in terms of domestic politics? And the second part of my question is, do you see this kind of program replicated in other parts of the world? Uh, in, in the case of contingency in Northeast Asia, you mentioned that you we have to learn to live with a nuclear North Korea. So what does that like what does that mean? Can can this kind of program be implemented to reduce nuclear dangers in that part of the region in that part of the world? Thanks. Uh. There are two very difficult questions. Let me try the first one. <clears throat> the reason we see, see the non nuga program succeeded, it had to have two elements. First of all, it had to pass in the Congress, which is not easy. And secondly, it had to be implemented in the executive branch. It passed in the Congress because Senator Nunn was a visionary who understood the dangers and he was able to partner with Senator Lugar and together, they made it a bipartisan or nonpartisan program and were able to get support. Uh, I can't think of a comparable situation in the Congress today. There's no, as I told you, Senator Lugar lost his primary election and Senator Nunn retired. So there's nobody of equivalent stature and equivalent knowledge in the Congress today. And there's no added. I would say even more generally, there's a very unlikely to see any bipartisan program put together in the Congress this year, this last year or this year. So that was the comment about none of the You had a second question. Remind me what the second question was. Do you, under what conditions can this kind of program be replicated in other parts of the world, uh, especially uh, when it comes <clears throat> to cases yes. in this regard in North Korea? Conceptually, it could be, and it could be very useful. It could be useful in, in Korea. It could be useful in India and Pakistan. <clears throat> I see no prospect of that happening, but conceptually, it, it's, it's a very, it's an excellent idea. And a couple of years ago, people were thinking of, of actually trying to do that. In particular, there was a serious discussion of trying to get an our program going in, in, in North Korea. But there's very little likelihood politically that that's going to happen in the next year or two. Great, so we're almost out of time. I have time for one more question. Uh, and so I'd like to ask uh, Wright Smith uh, to ask, ask your question. Wright, over to you. Mm -hmm. 
Wright, are you still there? Sorry, yes, I was muted, I apologize. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for giving us such a, um, a sobering talk. I think it's always important to keep the stakes of what we- you, If you thought it was sobering, you were listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question I would like to ask is there's, um, there's been some work by, by previous students uh, at MIT, uh, essentially arguing that technological change is eroding the security of second strike platforms, whether that is submarines, whether that is uh, mobile missiles, and that those dynamics could make a, a counterforce strike plausible. And so I was hoping to ask how concerned are you that that is actually possible and um, what that would do on this issue of, of nuclear security? Yeah, I have several comments about that. The first is underlying the, underlying the question is the belief that a disarming surprise attack is a real threat to the United States. I don't believe that it's true. I do not believe the Russians are stupid, and I do not believe the Russians are suicidal. I've met many, many Russians, including the highest level of the government through the years. I've never met one of them was stupid or suicidal. And they would have to be stupid or suicidal to try to sell an attack, no matter how many uh, clever weapons they had, which they think were going to dis uh, somehow disable our, re our response. So, the whole issue, the whole debate and discussion about, about this in this field is, is based on an incorrect assumption, which is that the name threat to the United States is a surprise disarming attack. And that's just not true. And I think it's demonstrably not true. Um, if it were, then we need to be very much concerned about having a completely in, invulnerable response. And we have ICBMs, which when we built them decades ago, were reasonably invulnerable. That is, they, we surrounded the ICBMs with, with tons and tons of steel and concrete, so that it, it took a direct hit almost to really take them out. And in, in the years we built the ICBMs, I seem to, nobody's ICBMs, ours or the Russians had that kind of accuracy. In the meantime, we've developed ICBMs with enough accuracy to destroy ICBM silos. And so what started off as an invulnerable basing, it's turned out to be a highly vulnerable basing. Um, one reasonable response to that was, was to shift our resources and not, and not use ICBMs because the assumption on which they were built in the first place is no longer true. But we don't do that. We sort of double down on the ICBMs and made, made them a primary response. Um, given that the ICBMs are so vulnerable and given, and given that we believe there's gonna be a surprise disarming attack, then it's necessary to have something to back up the ICBMs. And we have bombers and we have submarines. And the bombers uh, are also vulnerable because the bases can be destroyed. A way of solving that problem, or at least greatly mitigating that problem, would have put, the air, put our airplanes, make the airplanes airborne, 24-hour uh, airborne alert. We don't do that for, for good reasons. It's very expensive and it's somewhat dangerous because if the planes were somehow crash land with the nuclear bombs on, that would not be too good. So, <clears throat> But in, a, in an emergency, if we really believed there's a serious problem, and if we really believed that our ICBMs could be destroyed in their silos and our submarines would be destroyed also, we could put our bombers on airborne alert. Now, the, the, real, the key question along this line of reasoning is the submarines. What if the ocean became transparent? What if the Russians had found a way of looking through the ocean, seeing our submarines? In other words, what the Russians had a way of doing a real-time, precise location of each of our submarines at sea. That's a pretty fantastic thought, but it's not an incredible thought. So you have to th think about that. Was that possible? 
And so people today are talking about technology which might make our submarines vulnerable to attack. Um, I asked to say when I was the Under Secretary of Defense in 19, late 1970s, we had the same concern. The technology of the moment in those days was what's called a blue-green laser. There's a laser and a satellite which would look down at the ocean and then the, then the laser because of its wavelength would be able to penetrate and actually see the submarines. That was a theory. And so we were believed then that we could not depend on our submarines because of the possibility the Russians might develop a blue-green laser and put it in a satellite and be able to look to see. Today, people have given up on that idea. But we have a new one now, the new idea is there might be thousands of mini submarine drones out there that would somehow be able to detect our submarines. And then the Russians would be able to launch at the same time they fired missiles to destroy our silos or fire other missiles to destroy our submarines. Uh, first of all, the whole thing is based on the presumption that the Russians would like to make a surprise or something attack which itself I think doesn't bear much water. Secondly, it, it assumes that they get all of this, all of our ICBMs in the silos, which is a pretty far stretch. And, it's, it, and it assumes that this new technology, maybe it's, maybe it's the huge swarms of drone submarines would have detected our submarines and they would be targeted as well. And that they get all of them, all of the submarines. If they miss one, one submarine, one submarine has enough warheads, enough missiles, enough warheads on to destroy Russia or any other country. I mean, a submarine has a huge, a nuclear submarine has a huge uh, destruction power. So you put this all together, it's a pretty incredible argument. And the argument is not whether we would believe it, but whether the person who's gonna be attacking Russia would convince himself that all this was going to work every time against every weapon. Because if they miss, as I said, one submarine, or even if they miss one bomber, they're in all the, they're in for, or even if they miss one ICBM, they're in for a lot of, a lot of destruction. So I find the whole argument incredible, really, but I, I listened to it, and I, I cannot make an F equal MA argument saying it couldn't be done. But I do have a long memory, and I remember we were worrying about this new ama amazing technology that was going to make the oceans transparent, which is going to make our submarines vulnerable. I've been listening to that argument for a good many years, at least back to 1977, which is a long time ago. And so far, our submarines have still remained involved, and I think they will remain so for quite a long time. But the big point I would make, right, the big point I would make is what in the world the Soviets, or in this case, the Russians, gain by doing that? What do they gain? They can destroy a lot of the United States for whatever that may be worth to them. If they're lucky, they only get a few missiles landing in Russia. If they're not lucky, they may get Russia destroyed. So you have to, have to somehow put yourself in the mindset of a Russian leader and say, how could he have even ever be convinced that this is an intelligent thing to do? Well, that's, that's the best I can do on that question. Taylor, back to you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much uh, for your talk and for spending uh, this time with us. Uh, we're really grateful. Uh, you've given us so much to think about and I think I speak for all of us when I say uh, tonight and going forward, we'll be reflecting on really, are we doing enough in our own areas to prevent uh, the catastrophe that, that you outlined? And I think the collective answer will probably be no and that we need to do more. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you again uh, for, for, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, it's a grim topic, but your remarks are inspiring. And I think we're all inspired uh, to see if we can uh, do more and uh, do better. Taylor, thank you for those good words. And let me leave you with a final thought. If you really want to learn a little bit more about this subject, 
relatively minimal effort and go to my podcast. It's a, it's go to at the brink dot org at the brink dot org. Okay. You find the podcast there. There's a uh, eight eight or nine different podcasts, each one of which is about forty minutes. Listen to one of them. Listen to the first one, for example. And it's forty minutes of your time uh, just listening. And if you think you can learn something with that, go on listen to it. Listen, listen to more of them. It's my feeble attempt to try to educate the public, and I've try to get it down the simplest possible denominator. All it takes is listening for 40 minutes and you get and you get a real education. Thank you, Taylor. And it's good Wonderful. to you. Uh, good just to we, talk to your group today. We can't clap in person, but we can clap virtually. So everyone, please join joining me in thanking uh, Secretary Perry uh, for, for being with us today. Thank you. Good to be with you.